Let, let me jump into it here. We got episode 17, my favorite number, by the way. So congratulations. You are, you oh are here on lucky number. I was thinking of doing a solo uh, episode for number 17 to keep it all to myself. But uh, here we are. So guys, uh, you, you probably haven't, if you follow me kind of from the trading realm or the crypto realm or whatever, I'm not sure if you've heard of this guy, but I, I've found it really cool. Some of the most impactful um, mindset psychology podcast episode conversations that I've listened to were between this guy, Jared Alderman, 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 yeah. Alderman and uh, Jason Sue. Um, they were like very, they were great. They were just fantastic chats. I only think you had maybe two of them, maybe three. Um, yeah, but either way, they were they were right in my wheelhouse for what I enjoy talking about. And I'm always trying to kind of improve on whether that's just being more in the moment, trying to um, feel a sense of presence rather than looking in the future, worrying about the past, like um, all things that I've dealt with in my trading career, my poker career. Um, so yeah, welcome to the show. And uh, how you doing? What's going good. on? Yeah, uh, good. I'm going to let people know that I'm a little congested. So that's why my voice sounds a little odd. But yeah, other than that, I'm feeling good. I'm excited to sit here and talk. I don't know what we're going to get into, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So real quick, we were, we were just chatting that you, you've you kind of pivoted a little bit um, from, I mean, uh, give us our like your elevator pitch of like how, how you got to where you are now from from the past 10 years, just so people can kind of catch up with who you are. Woof. All right. That's a, it's a long, uh, it's a long elevator pitch, but I mean, the, the, the short points are, I was actually I've done a lot of, of random things. So when I was 21, I was playing poker and actually running a blackjack team, um, a card counting team professionally. Um, eventually decided I wanted to try to go into the Navy and be a Navy SEAL. Um, I went through, that pipeline, I went through buds. I quit in buds. Ended up becoming a Navy EOD tech the whole time. The whole time through all this, I was keeping up with poker and playing poker a lot. Um, then was a explosive ordnance disposal technician, and I worked on bombs uh, for six years. Got out of the Navy. Uh, kept playing poker. I was playing poker professionally and competitively. I was playing high stakes online. Was coaching. Um, various different things in my life had led me to like sort of have a what seemed to be a unique insight on like performance and and uh you know in poker what's called mental game and so more and more of my coachings when working with people in poker was uh oriented around mental game and performance and how to you know the sort of meta game aspects like the sort of soft game elements how to how to bring your best to the game every time you play and so the more that i was doing that the more that i enjoyed it and so now i work almost exclusively in that field doing performance coaching uh with people across many industries uh from from business to sports to uh performing performing arts and uh and poker so pretty standard pretty standard last 10 years i would say nothing really yeah, yeah. special there uh we all did um uh, kind of anti-explosive stuff for a while and kind of moved yeah, out of yeah. that into poker i mean it makes complete sense pretty standard um yeah. That's cool. Like when, when you, um, were people telling you, Hey man, like you have a sense of like the meta game that's a little bit different than like how we're all approaching this. Or were you realizing that along the way yourself? Like how do you kind of stumble into that side of things? Yeah. I mean, I've always been fairly like self-reflective of a person. Like when, when things don't work out for me in my life, I think it's been always, it's just been sort of a habitual norm that I sort of start with what's happening inside of me to cause that. And that's been something that's I've noticed throughout my life. That's just kind of different from most people, uh, as a, as just like a standard way of assessing what's happening. People tend to assess what's happening outside of them first. Um, and I think throughout that process of just like doing that a lot over my life, then when I would start coaching people or I mean, even just casually talking poker with people, it became more and more a thing where like, I'd be talking with people and be like, but like, what are you thinking in this spot? Like, what are you like, what's going through your head? Like, and people were very interested in talking like theory and like things like that. And I was always interested in like, why are you thinking about that thing in this moment? Like, how are we, how are we, how, are we reviewing the the you know are we like taking a step back and like 
analyzing what we're thinking about what we're how we're playing and and when you keep dropping that back like why are we thinking that why are we doing this why are we doing this eventually you just sort of like roll all the way back to just like it just comes into like what you're feeling and like what you want and like these rarely based desires and so i think as i just started talking with people more there was a lot of things that i was processing you know i also have a robust background in meditation i do two meditation retreats a year um anywhere from like 10 days to i don't know uh, 18 days uh but so like all of this came together to where when i would be talking to people there was a lot i realized i was sort of taking for granted about what how i was processing my decisions and how other people were and more more importantly the level of awareness of what how of what was happening when i was processing decisions and so when talking with coach when coaching with people that just sort of became more and more of a focus because that was where i clearly was like this is where i have something to gain and um to give you know like this is this is where i'm noticing the biggest disconnect between what i'm doing and what you're doing it's not our understanding of the game it's not like what facts we know it's not how much we've studied it's it's what you're thinking when you're about to click buttons and how you're reviewing what you're thinking when you're about to click buttons and improving on it you know yeah yeah uh, i remember like you know everybody tells poker hands in like a vacuum very yeah. often and i often remember and i i don't think i ever like realized that i was doing it at the time and it sounds like you were starting to realize it over like it's like you could, like somebody tells you this situation and it's like it just lacks so much context in the broader yeah. scheme of things it's all just like a what am i supposed to do on the turn here right like and and it's like well how is your session going how are how are you playing? Were you up? Were you down? Were people around you up or down? Was it, were you, um, yeah. were you awake? Were you tired? Like, like there's so much lacking information that like even a standard answer could be like the wrong answer. Right. Yeah. Like, and it's funny cause I've always, there's like the camp of these days, you know, for anybody that knows poker is, is like everybody's, I think channeling their energy towards, balance and, and and optimal decision making and all these things um but like i've always loved the artistic side of poker and i love the artistic side of trading and that's why like the whole field player genre is like always been a soft spot for me and why i love li live poker right yeah. i love diving into like okay like before we get to the hand build me a setting you know, yeah into your seat before we like get dealt the cards um, yeah. so did you tend to start having those conversations and people like people would all of a sudden start coming to realizations a little bit before maybe getting to the actual hand? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, you're, when you're working with people, it's really, you're really limited by their ability to like sort of self-reflect. Right. So like, so even when trying to get people to understand the difference between, you know, we're playing it, we're looking at a hand and I'm like, this seems fine. And they're like, yeah, it seems fine. And I'm trying to get people to reflect on like what makes a decision seem fine to you and what what do you think is happening in my head that makes it seem fine to me? Because and like even trying to get people to put words to certain things can be very be very difficult. And there's so much data like and that's the biggest thing is like understanding like getting people to realize like I'm just trusting you. Like if you if you had a sense like when we we're talking about a hand like if you had a sense like this spot's over bluffed and so you called it's like okay like I'm just gonna go with it because there's so much context that like it can't be translated you know what i mean like yeah. there's no way you can translate the context of a hand of what it was like like that's a huge part of like what i work with people on is understanding the, the the limitations of language and capturing your experience you know like and there's so much there's so much in western culture in general but also in poker community especially in the poker community and just any community where like people leverage explicit reasoning a lot that people believe l language is experience like it's the same thing so uh, there's there's nothing i experience that i can't communicate to you um that's just so far from true and for people who don't know how to experience their experience directly without the use of language uh, you're overlooking a lot of useful data and so more often than not i'm not actually trying to get a setting i'm trying to listen deeply like if i'm doing poker coaching which i do less and less of but if i'm doing poker coaching when i'm when you're talking about the hand i'm just listening really deeply to you uh to you talk about it 
and listening to like picking up all the little nuance of like how you felt about the hand. And that's more data than you telling me, oh, this guy was doing this, this guy was, and then sometimes, you know, obviously there could come some corrections can come. But if I just like really listen to you and like think about how you felt and like take in your feelings in that moment in that hand, um, usually you can get a pretty good picture of what someone thought was going on just through that, even if they don't know, you know, even if they, if they don't realize that uh, that's what's going on. And that ability is useful while playing poker too, like learning how to like really listen to people. Um, obviously super important when just looking at somebody across the table and trying to suss out what's happening in their experience, having the skill to be able to like look, like see people deeply uh, is a very valuable experience at poker table. But So, I mean, I, I assume before, do you think it's easier to, to see people for what, for what they're feeling in the moment or to see yourself and reflect on yourself. Maybe it's different for for everybody, but like for you personally, um, mm -hmm. has it always been easier to self-reflect and then move from there or to see somebody and like get those mirror neurons or whatever it is and really under, kind of be able yeah. to feel them? Uh, there's a bit of a, this is tough. Like you don't really ever see anybody, right? Like you only ever, everything is your experience. So like in some sense, right? Like every thought I'm having of you is just a thought in my experience. And it's all going to be filtered through my lens of judgment and, and, and bias, which is why one of the most important skills and being able to like see people deeply is to lessen the amount of judgment and criticism you have towards yourself, because all of that's going to filter your everything. Your picture of the world is all going to be passed through all of those filters. So I, it's a little complicated because like it's, it's really not possible to see people, um, without yourself being in the mix somewhat but you can be a little bit more aware of what's in the mix and like um like obviously i wouldn't be getting any data from you if you weren't there right but but what i'm seeing from you is all is all filtered through my experience my like you know my ideas and i think having a respect for the immense gap between us is what allows me to like look at you with real interest and curiosity and like constantly trying to inquire as to what's going on in you and realizing I'm never really going to settle on what it is to be James in this moment, you know? And when, because we have our direct experience, it's so common for people to just like treat their experience and especially their language. This is a function of like the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere is very like arrogant in this way, but like as just fact, it's just like my, my impression of you, my experience, this just is fact. I'm just going to take that as fact and act in the next moment as though that were fact. But when I realize my experience is just mine and like there's just like this infinite gap between us, and then when everything you do and everything you, you say to me and how I act and how you respond to it, it's just sort of this like investigation that I can constantly treat it as. You know, like I can constantly be just looking at like, well, I, th I was expecting you to kind of respond in this way and you didn't. And so like, you clearly are seeing this a little different than I thought that I was. And, and, um, yeah, I think when you know that, like you don't experience anybody ever. So when you're trying to, that, you know, deserves a lot of respect and a lot of, and especially when you're trying to render, like even for things like trading, you're trying to render the experience of, you know, thousands or millions of people or something to like try to predict, um, things like that. There's just like this immense gap and like when you can be really open, it requires a lot of openness to really try to like take in uh, what is people's experience, you know, and uh, at poker, you just have to really respect that gap and people have a hard time with that. They want hard answers, just like you were saying, right? They just want like this was this or this, but it's really just something you're constantly approaching, but never reaching. That's just really the best you can. And this is true for yourself too. You're never like, this is just one big fucking mystery. You know, I don't know if swearing is allowed on this, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you know, it's just like, it's just like a mystery. So like treat yourself. I think you should treat yourself um, with just like deep curiosity constantly, you know? Yeah. I, I find that to be very interesting. Like I'm getting better at, at trying to like, step outside and build build a gap um to mind about myself right to to kind of be able to create create that gap and not be you know sometimes i like to be right here and to to feel it and stuff but then i like to build a gap to really like look at what's happening and be like wow like you know maybe this is beneficial maybe this is hurting me whatever so do, do you think that quote unquote feel players 
subconsciously are really good at having this ability to, to create a gap between them and somebody else and, and like respect it and, um, have perspective and be able to like exploit that. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you take someone like you take someone like a, like a, like a Phil Ivy, right? So like, technically probably not the soundest like probably spent zero time in a solver right but like where he gets his edge is he's just incredibly present from what i've heard i've never played with him but from what i've heard from the people who have played with him he's just incredibly there you know and he's just he's really looking at you like to try to see what's going on in your experience there's there's field players who are just stubborn and don't want to study you know so i don't want to group them all together yeah. You know, there's 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 field players who just project their inner world onto the field and who might happen to be right because of the field that they're playing in, right? So like they can just coincidentally be projecting correctly, but but like you take them into an environment they're unsure and it's going to all crumble. But like a truly good intuitive player, yeah, is just going to like it's going to mind the gap between them and someone else. And so because of that, they're going to look at somebody with like deep interest and curiosity in each moment and, and then, and just trust what happens in them, you know, and, and, uh, over time, I think you, this is a skill I think you can get much better at. There's a really good book that just came out actually by David Brooks called how to know a person. I highly recommend it for anybody who's interested in this topic. How to know a person. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a really good intuitive field player can, can create this gap, look at somebody with intrigue and interest in the moment. And then with the muscle part, it's almost like they need to then trust their read on that situation, right? And then yeah. over time, that muscle gets better and better to where their self-trust is probably like an IV, right? Where he's at the level where he's he's – He's played decades and decades of this to where he's not going to question what he feels at this point. He's just going to do it. And then yeah. that's where you get to these situations where people are just like, what the fuck kind of decision was that? Right. Like yeah. that doesn't make any sense in this situation. Yeah. I mean, I think to be clear, like, I think we all really do this all naturally. I think we all have, we're social animals. We're deeply in touch with the subtleties and nuance of other people. And we also, I think, naturally really trust ourselves. I think there's just a lot of things get in the way in our like upbringing and our, in our lives and our culture. And so like a lot of like my work with people is really just like clearing out the hedges to do what feels natural, you know, like it's, it's kind of like an anti skill. It's not really like a, a, a building up, but like a, just like stop doing these things. Like, you know, um, all the things that get in your way, just stop doing those. That's the skill, you know? So like, it's quite natural to just like look at somebody and see them. You just have to like not be so judgmental of every, everything that comes into your experience. That's, that's really what it is. Um, you know, we're so inclined to just be like, Oh, I, I like this or I don't like this. You know, we have like this tendency to just like pursue things we like and get away from things we dislike and judgment of other people's is just that about personality traits or things that we perceive and like, and so when a raw personality trait, you know, if I see someone, I'm like, oh, you're malicious. And that's not the data I'm getting from them. Like the data I'm getting from them is they they did something like outwardly and I didn't like it. And so I'm assigning you like a morally negative trait. You know, so like, let's say like I watched, uh, I was watching my kid play at the playground and I was sort of investigating this in myself while it was happening. And I, I watched this kid like push kind of like push my son and my son's like naive. He doesn't know. And he was just like, Oh, and just like ran off. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering at what point we start learning that like, Oh, that kid like meant me harm. When in reality, like what was probably going on in that kid's experience was like, he just wanted to feel powerful. Right. Like he probably just wanted to feel strong. He probably saw someone that like, you know, he wanted to exert his strength to make himself feel safe and in control and, and powerful. There's a very big difference between that and being malicious. You know, he's trying to protect himself, he's trying to make himself feel good. And, you know, so we have all these ways of creating judgments on people and judgments on ourselves and judgments on what's acceptable. 
And this is really what gets in the way of just seeing things clearly. Because like you're getting that data, you're getting this, this urge for someone to like, to want you to feel small. Like you can see that, but we judge that. Like we judge that as like, oh, that means you're a bad person. That means you're malicious, right? That means you're like a bad. And so instead of just like, no, they want you to feel small because they want to feel big. That's not malicious. They just, they're just scared, you know? And so, yeah, but, and often we do that to ourselves too. So like we do something like that. We're like, oh, I, that was a malicious thing for me to do you know, or anything like that. So a lot of just seeing people clearly is just, it's just like tuning down these judgments towards ourselves. Because it's just like I said at the beginning, right? All we have is ourselves. So you're not judging anyone else. It's not, it's not possible. You're having a thought in your head. You're having an experience in your body and you're judging that experience. That's why it happens. That's why we project because it, if it happens and it's about us, we judge it that way. If it happens and it's about someone else, we judge it because it's the same data. It's just all happening in your experience. So when you can learn to like not judge yourself as much, you won't judge anybody as much because it's all the same. So you just tuning down these judgments, tuning down these ways we we distort the data that comes in is how you start seeing people clearly. And then trusting yourself is just a process of learning like that that is data. Like so much of culture is built on people putting on like instead of like what I'm saying, which is like removing the judgments. It's like, no, we need layers and layers and layers of judgments to try to like filter this ball that's pinging pong to like the right column. And so what happens is people just don't trust themselves. They think like when they get to the end of something, they're like, all right, well, is this the end? Like, is, do I need another filter to like put this thing through to like, no, is this the right decision? But when you just like strip it all away, you see things clearly and trusting yourself is the most natural thing in the world. Cause you're like, this is just, this is just the information I have. What else can I do? Right? Like, this is just all I know. Like I can't act on something I don't know. So like. This is, this is the best I can do, you know? Do you think that's why authenticity is such like, um, I feel like we're in a time where authenticity and like realness or truth or whatever is like, it's almost starting to be revered because like, it's hmm. almost like somebody that is able to do that has maybe they've, they've been able to tune out a lot of the noise, but then they're also not afraid of themselves being judged for vocalizing like the data that they've taken in yeah um and because of that i see somebody like that and i'm like wow what a what a trait that person has because they're not scared of the repercussions of like uh vocalizing what they've learned does yeah. that make sense at all yeah i mean i think it's very attractive to just like see people living without the fear that so many of us like carry around all the time, you know, like, I think that's a big thing. And it's a, I mean, it's a, it seems like a brave thing to do almost to be authentic, you know, like it seems like, but it, it really like, in my opinion, if you're just authentic, like if you're truly just transparent with people, you can say almost anything to them and they won't care. You know, people have really good sense, like really good instincts for who they can trust, you know, and there's no one less trustworthy than someone desperate, desperate for status, desperate for money, desperate for meaning, desperate for love, desperate, it doesn't matter. Whatever you're desperate for will cause you to do things people can't trust. And so when people can, when people can de de detect in you that you're not okay, that you're really desperate for something out, out that, and you believe that source is out in the world, um, people aren't going to trust you. They have really good instincts for that and it's going to make them very uneasy. But when you're, it's, you know, it's all, in, when you're transparent and you're just honest and you're just yourself, it's pretty clear you're not like looking for anything, mm. you know, like I'm just, I'm just me. Um, you can like this, you can dislike it, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to say it anyway. And what that lets people know is like, you're not going to use me to get something for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to like take advantage of me. And so that's, I think that's why it's such an admirable trait is because like, when you're when you're really transparent, you're really just comfortable with yourself, and you're comfortable with what you have. Um, yeah, people know like, okay, this is someone I could be around because they're they're not looking for something from me. You know, they're not they're not I, I'm not validating anything in them. Which is why, as a coach, it's one of the most difficult things for me to get over is the projections people cast onto you as a as a coach. You know, people come into sessions with you know with me. One of the hardest instincts is to like be comfortable and open and nice to somebody who's expecting so much from you um, because it's um, 
it's just a lot of you can, you can feel it you can feel like the yeah the desperation from people of like you know fix the, and and the truth is only they can help themselves and every human's instincts when faced with that kind of desperation is to like distance yourself from it and as a coach you're faced with it all the time and so you to, to be able to like create space and hold the projections that people put onto you i think is one of the most valuable traits as a coach i've noticed that myself with um hiring a coach is like you're literally paying for like almost like a private room to be able to divulge and and try to get rid of the noise and to be more truthful and to not be judged yet it's still hard to just like it's like i assume the same thing with like a psychologist or a therapist or things like that yeah. you're, literally, you're literally going there to to find a safe place but yeah. we still have all these onion layers around us that like won't allow ourselves to do that because because now i want jared to like me i want i want the coach to like yeah. not see all these errors that i have i need to be like okay with you knowing like the worst things about me or whatever in order to even move forward so yeah i imagine from the reverse role you understand can feel that happening and it's hard to like yeah. break through that yeah i mean i think that's why as a coach it's really important to like consistently show up as uh, like unmoved by those things you know like when i when i when i can consistently show up and be like this works both ways not it's not just not being judgmental to you but it's also like not attaching your meaning to your successes um it doesn't mean not being happy for you not being excited for you but i want to mirror to people how i think people should treat themselves you know which is just like all of these successes failures whatever feelings emotions thoughts it's all just it's all just phenomenon that's just constantly changing it's not you you know like all of it is just so like i for you for me to treat you is just like you're fine like i like i'm not I'm not, I'm not looking like I'm, I'm for you to come in and want something from me. That's okay. You can come in and not want something from me. That's okay. Like, you know, and like to consistently show up as just like a space for somebody to like voice things is where I think over time they become really comfortable with just being who they are and, and being really honest with you. And it's, it's, it's hard because you can really, you know, we're all people. And so we all have our own judgments and it's uh, especially this kind of work that I do, you know, you can really break people's trust sometimes by saying the wrong thing in the right on the wrong moment and hurt someone's feelings. And uh, yeah, so it's just, it's, I think it's, it's something that should be taken, um, you know, you know, seriously and with a lot of reverence, but. Do you feel like uh, meditation has like, I mean, in a sense, this all seems to kind of go back to that right when i when i personally think of meditation so i i don't do it right it's always yeah. been a thing that's kind of revolved around me but i've never really incorporated it um but when i think of that word i think of reduction of the noise reduction of the inputs in order to feel what's happening in a certain in in a certain moment without any of that actually like hmm. um distorting my current present view of what's happening and if you're able to kind of like consistently reduce that or like a muscle kind of kind of try to get into that space more and more and more often that you can hopefully then in these high pressure moments um be able to do that maybe subconsciously at least a little bit because it's hard to just be like wait a second hold on big trade yeah. happening um let me turn everything off real quick and get get in there is that um, generally how you see that effort of, of meditation and, and how does it play a role for you? Yeah. I mean, it's obviously it's, it's super integral to my life and like, and the, the way that I approach coaching, I would point to an interesting word that got used, you know, when you started saying, which was like a reduction in noise reduction by definition is comparing this moment to a future moment right we're saying there's less of this in the future and i i would say i would say um meditation for me is just about the practice of being here with what's happening it's not a reduction it's not goal oriented goals by definition are in another time they're not here so it's um no it's really just being present and um yeah conditioning 
it's tough because you, you start getting trapped by language when trying to describe what is the practice of meditation because it really is the experience of just what is what is truly happening right now and whatever that means for you there can be noise that's fine the question is can we not judge ourselves for that noise and can we just take it in for what it is and i think you can find over time with meditation that like yeah you have a lot more space for a lot more experience than you thought and um, we have this tendency to sort of collapse down mentally around a certain thing in our experience and uh define ourselves through that and react really heavily to that and uh yeah meditation is really just a journey of like non-reactivity it's just like to let things come into your experience and just let them be and like it's not something you created um any more than if like i you know a, tr a loud truck drives by i'm gonna hear it and i didn't create that sound um the thoughts the 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 feelings the things that enter my mind i didn't create them they're, they're just phenomenon that are beyond me and i'm just a witness to them so can i can i just like allow them to move through and then when useful thoughts useful ideas useful feelings come into my mind can i use those and can i let the ones that seem not useful not not to get rid of them because everything moves in its own time i don't have to get rid of it right like i don't have to get rid of any feelings they they just they they get they go when they're ready you know and it's just can we be here for that can we just be here for what's happening while it's happening and personally i found that in in the midst of any experience there's this just like beautiful rich energy of being alive and it's and it's and it's amazing no matter what's happening and it's just it's just choosing to remember that you know it's just choosing to remember that you're alive you didn't have to be the the number of people who aren't alive infinitely outnumber the number of people who are you know by quite a few yeah by quite a bit you know so and then and then not to mention the people who are never born and so just like whatever you're going through is just like this energy of being alive and it's it's nothing more than that you know it's just it's just what it means to be alive you know and and then it's just and it's, it's just and then it's just about having like growing in you know what i would call wisdom about what's useful and what's not you know so like thoughts come into your head that's fine but are they useful? You know, I'm a narcissist, like deeply, like, <laughs> like, it's just my natural tendency. Like, I'm just deeply narcissistic. And I, I used to judge myself a lot for narcissistic thoughts that I'd have. Um, and it wasn't until I realized like this, you know, what difference does it make that this thought comes into my head? It's, 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 do I believe it? Do I act on it? Do I react to it? And most of the things we do that we dislike about ourselves are actually in reaction to these things. They're out of judgment. They're like, most of the things we we do because I was afraid, it's because you wanted to get rid of the fear. The fear had no problem. I thought if I did this thing, fear would leave. You know, I'm anxious. I need to do these things to get rid of anxiety. So it's like, it's these two arrows in the teaching in Buddhism. You know, it's like the, the initial pain, but then the second arrow is all the things we do in reaction to it and that second arrow is the one that really hurts us it's it's all the desire to change things it's all the, it's all the activity around like i i got to get rid of this energy i got to get rid of this so meditation for me is is not about reducing or increasing or or it's it's by you know it's by definition accepting it's not change it's just what is here and what's needed based on what's here you know and that was i have a teacher who that's what she you know she told me that's the two things you can always ask yourself it's just what's what's here and what's needed. Hmm. And so, yeah. I think that's pretty, that's pretty interesting though. Like the narcissism thing is like, uh, that it's there and then that's okay. But like what, what you then do with that, right? Like, I guess, hmm. I guess that starts leading with the second arrow or whatever, but like, I, it makes me think of the person that's like, that says, I'm an asshole, right? Like, like it, it, it's like, ah, I'm just an asshole. So like they, but then they act in accordance with that trait that they deem now as part of themselves. And it's like a buyout yeah. in a sense, or, yeah. um, or like somebody that's like, oh, I just really just, I'm not about that dramatic life or whatever. And then somehow drama lives around that person. Yeah. Um, so when I hear that, I, I think of like things like that, or or even like for myself of like, um, uh, 
with trading, right, and and poker, you'd always have these questions of like how how I perceive myself as a player, as a trader, and then but am but am I expressing that or not? I think that's like a good good probably self reflection lesson or thing to start paying a little bit more attention to, right? Am I saying the words and also acting out in that fashion, or like yeah. thinking and saying and acting, or am I just thinking it? But like that's about it. And if, if, if so, that's kind of. Yeah. I mean, in in, in my opinion, I I just think you don't need to identify with any of it. Right. Like, like I, I don't think, you know, you're a different person moment to moment. You know, you ask me like, do you like to read? Yeah. Like I'm packing a book on a plane because I like to read. I get on the plane. I don't feel like reading. What does it, what does it mean that I like to read then? Like, I don't even know what I want to do. You know, like, what does that even mean that like, I like to read? it depends on when you ask me, right? Like, would I like to read a book right now? No, that'd be very rude to you. (laughs) Right. Like, and so like we, we have these traits that we, we take to be something about us and it's just a, it's just a moment to moment experience of, of something, you know? So like, I feel like I, I would say, I I used to say I'm a narcissist because I I had thoughts that were very self-aggrandizing, you know? So like I'm a narcissist now, but I have a thought that moment and the next moment I'm thinking what I want for lunch. Am I a narcissist in the moment I'm thinking about what I want for lunch? You know? No. And just because I'm thinking about what I want for lunch doesn't mean I have to go make lunch. Mm-hmm. And like, and so like, yeah, I have thoughts that come into my head that are self-aggrandizing. You know what else I have? I have thoughts that come in that are really self-defeating and that are really, that make me feel really small. And like, and I, and those narcissist thoughts are kind of in response to that. So nothing's just so simple. Like we're not, we're not one thing, you know? And it's really, again, that's like why, you know, it's just like, what's here, what's here now. This is who you are now. You know, like you don't have to, you don't, we use these categories because they feel safe. You know, it feels secure. I feel like I I, I can grab onto something solid, Mm. but you're just like this constant river of change. That's, that's all that you are. And in each moment, it's just about tuning into like, what, who am I now? What feels right to me now? What's happening in my experience now? And can I let go of all of these ideas of who I am, what I want globally? Because like suddenly like I'm thinking like, oh, I like to read books. And then like my time for reading books is here and I don't want to do it. And I'm like judging myself, you know, like I need to be a person who reads books, you know, like I'm like judging myself for it. And it's like, you just don't want to read a book, dude. Like relax. You know, and like people do this in like poker games where they're or like whatever field that they're in. Like I'm aggressive. I'm an aggressive player. And then they find themselves aggressing in a spot they don't think is right because they're an aggressive player. And they just like tell themselves that. Just if you're an aggressive player, it will just happen. Right. And the spots where it makes sense for you to aggress, it will just happen. Just be you in each moment. And each moment's different. And what's right in each moment is different. And so like you just have to check in with who you are now. There's no stable you. Every cell in your body's gone every seven years, you know? So like, what is this you you're talking about? That's just like, I am this, you know, you're, um, you are change. If you're anything, you're change. And, um, I think getting deeply in touch with that, uh, it's, it's very easeful. Like you can just relax, you know? And, and also it's just where all the details are. Like, you everything in your body is constantly changing all of your experiences are so when you get used to checking into what it's like to be you in this moment that's where all the details are about what you want to do and like what you what how you want to act you know it's not in these thoughts based conceptual ideas about who you are and what this is and like what that is and like no it's just you just feel it you know do you feel like um uh, a good way to like for me that yeah like I, I concept conceptually understand that I suppose right but yeah. I'll find myself filling the void of f- dealing with these thoughts um, with whatever podcast Twitter like telling myself I'm learning something or whatever right because I can't just you know I, I definitely struggle with the idea of just like sitting there and doing nothing right um, and we've been rewarded these days with that. You don't have to anymore, James. Got it all for you. 
Um, yeah. So one, one thing I, I'd be curious, I'd be curious what you mean by this doing nothing. Like I, I so like, okay. Yeah. For instance, um, I, I, I like to eat, right? Like I like mm-hmm. to eat food and it fills a lot of the time between like activities in my day. Right. So yeah. like, I wake up, I tend to do like the walking treadmill and I trade and I drink a coffee and then there's this lull and then I eat during the lull and like watch a podcast and then I'll trade Mm. again and then I'll eat and then I'll work out and then we'll pick up the kids and I'll eat and then like it'll be kind of time to wind down and put them to bed and whatever, right? So like it fills a decent amount of the the gaps in in my day and Mm. then I did this fast the other week. I did like a four-day fast. Um, which was cool and different. I had done a couple three day ones, but I was like, all right, that I know that fourth day is going to be a little, a little bit of a bitch. So I was like, all right, let's do that. And all of a sudden I got these three, four hours of the day where I'm left there thinking like, ah, normally, um, you know, I'm kind of doing this, but I'm kind of walking around the house like aimlessly. Right. Like, like I, I'm so routine that like, this is a big change in my routine. The days feel longer and there's just a lot more going on. Right. Or I'll notice if I go to the beach, like the beach is a cool place. I'm in San Diego, right? The beach, uh, is like a disconnect, right? And everybody feels that at the beach, they feel this sense of like, they just love the beach. And I think a lot of it is because all of a sudden you're left with like, I can't hear you. Your mic went off. Can you hear me now? Oh, yep. There you're back. I'm back. Yep. Sorry. Weird. I, you I said can, the beach. Always, disconnect can, at the beach. All right. Sorry. That's yeah, perfect. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so like at the beach, there's a, another sense of like, a, oh, wait, what do you do now? And it's like, you just kind of sit, well, let's, let's dig our feet in the sand or like go touch the water or whatever. So mm-hmm. it's, it's interesting to me in these moments, like the fasting or whatever, that like, I realize how much I filled the voids, um, day to day or do fill the voids day to day to avoid all of the like and i feel like i introspect a lot but like i feel like there's a lot more that i could do i just like shove it away because i'm like ah fuck it i'm just gonna fill it with content and fun yeah but i mean i'd be curious what you mean by i mean introspect often brings to mind like a very heady analysis of ourselves you know because i i think there's you know, even listening to you describe that, you know, it's kind of like you're viewing, we, it's very natural for us to view the world through the, the categories we construct of the world. So, for example, if you were to ask people today, what does like a dog and like a rabbit have in common? People will be like things like they have four legs, they're mammals, like, you know, things like this. If you'd ask people like 40 years ago, and there's actual data on this, they say something like, you use dogs to hunt rabbits. Hmm. Because that's grounded in experience. That's that's something I do. So even listening to you describe your day and this idea of doing nothing, it's built around these categories, these boxes of what an activity is. Right? It's like, oh, I, this was eating. This, this, this was eating, you know, this, this 30 minute time, but it wasn't, it was like chewing and being there and watching something and breathing, you know, like I, maybe I put it down for a moment. It was all of these moments. It wasn't that I ate, you know, it was all these moments and each moment you're doing the same, you're doing the same things. You're just living, you know? And so like, And in those moments, what you'll find is there's experience, there's pleasant and unpleasant and neutral experiences, and we're just reacting to these. We we grab the pleasant, we push away the unpleasant, and we check out from the the neutral. And it's just the same phenomenon rolling on and on. That's it, though. There's just experience arising, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, react. Next moment, experience, react. Experience, react. This is our lives. That's it though. And like, and, and so like, then it's just, there's no, like, and again, all of this story is like, Oh, I push it away. Like I, I, you know, I fill the void. It's just all the same on some level, you know, you're, you're watching a thing. Well, you know, 
if you were looking here and like I would change, just like change what you're looking at in an instant, you know, it's just dots and colors changing. What changes it for you is your reaction to it, what it means to you. I put a naked woman in front of you. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's my reaction to that. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> yeah. You know? And so like, I just think there's a lot of like, what, what presence and meditation is for me. It's just about, you know, just seeing things for what they like, just being like letting go of some of these stories about what we do, you know, and like seeing this tendency to like, th again, think our ways into existence think think our lives into existence T today i did this it's you know it's you know today it's monday or tuesday what day is it tuesday yeah tuesday you know it's tuesday like what the, what the fuck does that even mean <laughs> it's tuesday it's this moment it's right now you know the the trees are moving the wind is blowing like tuesday's an idea you know it's just it's just an idea it's just this thing we think into existence you know it's just it's right now you know, and it's like, oh, this is work time. You know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, you even say like, I'm on the treadmill and I'm drinking coffee, but are you, are you on the treadmill drinking coffee? Like, are you really there? You know, no, I'm thinking probably like I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. And so for so many of us, if it's like, what are you doing? It's I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. And the thing about thinking is, is our minds are meant to learn from the past and to predict the future. That is, that is, that is what it's about. It's never here. And so our, I, you know, I heard an analogy once our minds are like a, a young dog you take to the beach and it just runs ahead of you and just runs behind you and just runs ahead of you and runs behind you. And that's your mind. It's just, it's just constantly trying to, to your, to your mind, the moment, the present is just this dispensable moment. It's just irrelevant. It just doesn't matter. It's just this thing only to be spent to forecast the future or to learn from the past. And so why is it so important? Why is that? It's because so we're all the data about what's happening to you. So this is to your, again, this breaks down from the hemispheres very cleanly. Ian McGill, Chris has some great books on this for anyone who's interested in this. Uh, Masters and his emissary is a great book. And, um, the matter with things is a two part series. Also a great book. Um, so the thing is about your mind and the thing is about, so let me, let me first talk about where your brain is really good, where, where, sorry, where your thoughts are really good, where these concepts are really good. They're really good for acting in the world. If I need to drink water, I need to be able to build a concept of things that hold water, right? So I need to be able to build a concept for things that hold water. I need to be able to scoop that water and then drink it. If I need to understand the world, I need a totally different mechanism. Concepts are good for acting in the world. Comprehending the world is done through direct experience in the present moment. And when you mistake these two, you start taking your ability to act in the world as what you understand about the world. And this becomes this infinite loop of acting based on things that aren't real. Right? So... The present moment is where all the data about who you are, what you want, what's happening, and what you should do next all exists. And this is why when you talk to people about being present, you talk to, you know, you had Jason Sue on here. So many people talk about connecting with your body because your body can't futurize. Your body's always here. Your mind futurizes. Your mind ruminates. Your body doesn't. It's always right here here and your thoughts are actually in reaction to your body as you get into like evolutionary biology it's fascinating why we evolved the ability to think everything we evolve has something to do with our ability to move if it didn't help you move and get food what use was it so our thoughts are all based on ways that we conceptualize how to act in the world how to move which means they're all related to changes in our metabolism Right. And our, and our bodies and our brains metric of how our metabolism is doing and burning metabolism. So when you're ever, when you're, when you're hardened around thoughts, you're, you're missing so much of the picture. So much of what your thoughts are, are reactions to your body and what's happening inside of you in order to help you move and, and get food and, and manage your metabolism in the world. That's why we crave relationships as well for the same reason. They have this effect on our metabolism. When we're around people, we feel safer. 
We, we, we actually burn fuel more efficiently. There's tons of reasons about this, but we forget that we're animals, you know, so often. And so many of these fundamental questions of like, just you, you're taking these thoughts to be reality, but like, why do you even think we have them? Like, what are thoughts? We've evolved these things for a specific purpose. And it's not to understand the world, it's to help us act in the world, it's to help us act in the world. And so when you look, when you look at the hemispheres, your left hemisphere is really good at building these concepts for acting in the world, explicit reasoning. That's why language is mainly located there, because language is very conceptual. But your left hemisphere almost gets no data from your right. So in your corpus callosum, all the data is actually one way. It's all the right hemisphere gets a ton of data from the left, but the left gets almost no data from the right. So when we're in this very conceptual, heady space, we're actually very shut off to the experiencing self, to the part of us that are experiencing the world, the part of us that's meant to comprehend the world. But when you're open and experiencing and you're comprehending the world, you still have all the data coming from your analytical self. You can still use that where it's useful, but it has to be in in its place of this wider space of what it means to be you. Hmm. Yes, yeah, it seems simple, right? Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. Uh, just hang out over here too, like it, it'll be fine. So, uh, how, okay, so I guess um, we can wrap it up soon, but like, what are some actionable ways got tons of time, for... dude. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> What's that? I was like, I got tons of time, we can go forever. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, what are some actionable ways for, um, Somebody like me, somebody like anybody, to yeah. to start. Um, I don't mean, yeah, like it, it comes to the language thing. I don't even know how to ask the question yeah. properly. But to to be to be more open to the or less maybe dominated by the conceptual side and yeah. living a little bit more in the comp comprehension side. Yeah, I mean, it all starts just with starting to notice the difference, right? Mm -hmm. So. There's obviously like meditative exercises that are really good of just experiencing your body, body scans, things like that. It also helps to like try to condition a resting place that's not in your head. Like it's so it's so no normal for us to rest our awareness and our attention in our heads, and it doesn't. We just presume that's just what it has to be, but it doesn't have to be like that. Like you can try to rest your attention, like what it feels like in your chest, and. Um, Ideally, you'll sort of widen your aperture of your attention to like just en encompass your whole experience. Like you can, for most people, this is quite difficult in the beginning because we we have naturally attuned to this sort of spotlight attention where we're just sort of like looking at one thing and looking at another thing and looking at another thing. And so when you start working with people and trying to like be wider, they find themselves like jumping around a lot, which is normal. Slowly over time, you'll be able to see you can actually hold more in your awareness at once than you thought you could. Um, and so it's just like starting to work on that. Like imagine a lantern of awareness as opposed to a spotlight sort of like flowing out from your, from the center of your chest. Um, and then specifically it helps to like investigate. This is, you know, Jason and I, who you had on here will differ on some of these investigation methods, but it can really help to, so you, you have a thought, right? So let's say you have this thought that is, uh, that's plaguing you. Some, something you notice, something you notice you think often. It can help to notice that it's just a thought. And one way to know to help you notice this, say it willfully. Right? So like will like like agently say it. So for example, if I asked you to start just start, start saying I like pizza, these are just words in your head. I like pizza. I like pizza. No, dude, that one's real. Yeah. But that one's real. <laughs> but you know, and then and that's the thing is start playing with this, right? It's just that's the thing is it's this playful, curious investigation around what what is the difference between deep belief in a thought versus words just pass through my head. And the truth is they're all just words that pass through your head. All of them. None of them are real. And so the more you have a better place to stand outside of your head, which is like, again, in your body, that helps a lot. The more you can rest your attention somewhere else. For me, it helps to widen my visual field, take in like all of what I'm seeing. To remember where I where I actually am, we sort of forecast. We sort of like broadcast ourselves out into the world and look back at ourselves a lot in our heads, you know. And so, like to be in my head, to be here, to be and to notice, I can't see my head, I can't see my face, you know, I can't see what's happening. Even looking at myself in this camera, like that's that's not me. 
that's something over there, you know? And so like widening in that way, having a place to stand outside of your head. And then when thoughts come up, you should be curious. Is this real? You know, is this, is this, is this what's really here right now? You know, one thing you can do that I do with people sometimes is like, imagine what you eat for breakfast because memories are this way. Memories can have this way of gripping us, feeling like we're there. And then just notice it's just images. It's just pictures and words and sounds that are happening as a part of this moment. Feel your body while you see those things. Feel your body while you think those things. And it's just another part of this moment. It's not, it's not, you're not there. So often when we're remembering things or thinking about the future, it's these images that feel like it's happening and your body goes through that experience metabolically and it starts, you know, getting ready for those things. But, um, yeah, slowly investigating these things, you can start just, it can be more natural to just sort of cut through the getting captured by thought, getting hooked by it. One thing when, when I think of all these things you're saying that I feel like I notice, and I think other people may agree with this in general is the concept of like time passing by fast or passing by slow. Yeah. And when I think of in those moments where you feel almost like a detective or like aware of, of thoughts and kind of looking at them and, and just being, you know, as close to what I would call in, in my moment, um, time seems to just go very slow. And then when I think about an area of time where I was not investigating that, and I was just, yeah. just churning that time is just, just, just going. So would you say time is almost in a weird way, able to give you a hint at whether or not um, you're starting to become more aware of, of these things or understanding them better? Or is that just another thing I'm kind of creating as a way to maybe realize it um, myself? I, I, I think, I just think there's no reason to assess how well you're doing at these things. Mm -hmm. Like you're living now, <laughs> you know? So like, however you think it felt, how time felt, again, you're just recollecting that now. Time could have not felt that way. You don't know. That moment's gone. That person's dead. Move on. <laughs> you know, like, so I think it's just important to like, just again, to notice these ways that we always want to be like assessing and evaluating ourselves to like some prior moment and forgetting that that assessment itself is not real. It's a thought in your head. You know, it's not, it's not there. And, um, it can feel real and all those feelings can be real to you. And like, and those, and that's the thing is that then you can get down to what really matters, right? Why did this feels really important to me? And that's, that's real. That's great. And like, and we can get into that, like that, that feeling, but when you're caught up, you know, believing in this, 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 that these things are there and that they're, you, they can distract you from like how it feels to you, which is really what matters, you know? So what do you say to somebody that's like, I don't think that's important. I think we should be thinking about our past all the time and how we can improve and we should be shooting for the future and setting goals. And, and I do need to judge myself and like what you're saying, meh, like, I don't, you know, what, yeah. like, what's the, the argument kind of to, as to why that might, um, like, why is that wrong? Maybe I have I mean, a feeling I mean, you're going like to say, my, you know what? My, my, I mean, my view of life is just like, dude, this may, may not be wrong for you. Like, I mean, right. you know, it's just the question is just like, is it useful? I think if if now we can have a philosophical argument on if those thoughts of the past are actually the past. And I would, you know, debate you that they're clearly not right. They're just your ideas of the past. So as long as you can keep that in mind, think about whatever seems useful to you. And there's all sorts of things that are useful. One thing that I will say that has been really useful for me is it's really important to remember that what got you here won't get you there. And so there's, there's tons of things that things that were useful to you at a point, they just, they've, they've served their purpose, let them go. And for a lot of people, they're just clinging on to things that they've done at one point that they think this is what's going to carry me all the way through my life. Mm -hmm. And if you can just be really open and just like see what's working and just take the feedback, um, then, you know, if it's working for you, keep at it. 
But the moment it stops, move on. Is that motivational to you to to think that way? Uh, like when you realize that, you know, your thoughts of a, a previous thing that's gotten you to this point is not maybe what's going to carry you to the next point. Is that motivational to you to like start new things and, and have new thoughts and try new routes because you're like, well, I'm probably just not going to do the same thing that got me here. Not necessarily because I will if it seems right, you know. Like there's plenty of spots where like what seems right is good. Um, there was a time when like trying to be less judgmental of myself, for example, I used to, there's a, the thing I used to say to myself was like, when thinking about past ways that I've felt, like I used to say like, oh, it makes sense you'd feel that way, right? Like it, ma it makes sense that you feel this way. It makes sense you feel this way. It used to be something. And, and it, it was kind of kind to myself to like let myself feel the way that I felt. But at a certain point, it started being actually kind of hurtful because I raised the bar of feeling okay to something that made sense. It had to be like conceptually rational. And so like it actually became a sort of judgment that if it didn't make sense, was it okay for me to feel that way? Hmm. And it was a really good way, a doorway into starting to care about the way that I felt. But at a certain point, it became a kind of self-judgment. Um, and it still feels right in some moments, you know? And so that's the thing. It's just, it's not really about motivation. It's just like, I just think we should like just take things as they come, you know, like, uh, so much people just want like, yeah, they just want like a roadmap and like a, a way things are and just like tell, you know, tell me the way things are. It's like, nobody fucking knows, you know, no, no, no one knows the way things are. And no one certainly knows the way things are for you in your corner of the universe. You know, they might know for them, but they don't know for you. And so for me, like I'm just taking things as they come. Um, trying to feel it out along the way. And, uh, and when something, when, you know, you have all the feedback you need, you know, I say, I say this because like, you, it's not, you don't need to assess, is this working for me? Like this, people have this like intellectual, like assessment, like you, you can just feel it. Like you just know, you know, like, does it feel good? You know, you know, and it's, this isn't hedonistic. This isn't like just grab everything that makes you feel vain pleasure. Because even in that, there's this clinging that feels bad that you can feel that you know. This is sort of desperate. I need this. I need this that you can feel. You know, and so that's the thing. All of the data is here. It's all right here. And it's like when it feels wholesome and consistent with who you are and your values, it's just, it's all to be felt here. And when things I'm doing are things that I've done in the past, I don't think about it. Like, is this something I've done in the past or not? Like, I don't care. It's just what feels right right now, you know? Is it a new thing? I don't care. It's just what feels right right now. Like, I don't, I just don't care. Like, I'm not, I'm not looking for trends or like, you know, and like in some senses, obviously, like, like I said, thought has its place, but like, I don't have some like rules or maxims that I'm trying to like assess my behaviors and see if they fit into. And I don't think anyone should, you know, just like be free to do whatever you want for whatever reason you want. Take the feedback, care about yourself, be kind to people and move on, you know? <laughs> yeah. Has this become easier or harder for you to deal with the world with this mindset? I'm going to guess easier as it's the way you've chosen to live your life. But if you yeah. were to consume media or meet people or whatever it is, and you just wish that they could kind of live a bit more in this fashion, that maybe everybody would then be better people and better understanding of each other and all that. But but if you're seeing that not be the case, is it very frustrating to you? Or are you just kind of like, well, that's just, that's just is what it is. And that's how I'm perceiving it. Like, yeah, I mean, so in Buddhism, you have like these four qualities that are really important. They're called the Brahma Viharas and not to get too esoteric on people, but, um, one of them, one of them that's really important, I think in life is equanimity, which is just, there's a few ways of describing equanimity, but the ones that I, I really like are um, not wishing things to be other than what they are, like not fighting reality. And um, another way that someone described it to me, which really resonated with me, was a, a willingness to be equally close to all things. And um, that's really important to me. I think in the, the way to really, the only way to really act wise, like skillfully and well in the world is to be really, you just have to accept the way the, wor the world is. 
it doesn't mean you can't have ambitions for the world to be better. But like when I interact with people, I just understand like everyone in the world is hurting. Like everything you see from somebody, again, there's so much of this is like people's judgments. Everything you see that you wish people wouldn't be doing is a result of pain. You know, it's the result of their of them in pain and trying to fix it. And everybody just wants to find love and to feel better. And um, yeah, again, not to get too esoteric on your podcast, but no, I think it's I really mean, when important. I hear like life is suffering, I, I, I think what you just said, it kind of like puts that to context a little bit. Sorry. Yeah, no. yeah. No, but I mean, I think it's really important then if you want to act well in the world, though, to really start from the place of this is the way things are yeah. and not like, ah, oh, why can't it be different? It's just... This is the way things are, you know? And again, it's the same thing. It's the same attitude toward yourself. It's just, it's not like, oh, like, why can't I be whatever? It's, this is the way things are. You know, like you can bang your head against it all you want, but this is the way things are. Mm. And yeah. And like, you know, I was talking to somebody, I was talking to my wife recently and we we're having a conversation and I was like, yeah, it'd be like, it'd be really nice if life was one where like things just worked out in the way that you wanted them to all the time. Like it, it would be great. You know, if, if good intentions, that's all that it mattered. It's just that you wanted what's best. But it's not that way. You know, it's just not. And so now what? Like you can keep wishing the world's that way, yeah. you know, but it's not. And so now it's just, okay, the world is the way that it is. What are you going to do? You know? And so like, if you really want to be willing to act well in the world, you have to be willing to see the world for what it is. And the only way to do that is to be really okay with whatever is the case. If you really want to take in, and same thing is true with yourself. If you want to take in all the data and your experience and act well in the world, it has to start by being a willingness to just see what's here. And um, that means not judging whatever you find. Well, we talked about pretty much zero poker and zero trading, but uh, I actually <laughs> thought all this stuff was was really cool. It's a... Uh, uh, you know, something I'm generally trying to think about more and work on and I feel like is increasingly important to the bottom line, even though it's maybe not, maybe not so obvious. So, yeah, uh, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Is there anything, uh, anything else you want to leave the people with other than your beautiful poetry you're spitting out there? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm sorry about my voice. Um, <laughs> Let's see. No, I mean, jaredalderman.com is coming. I'm rebranding. So if you want to come check out my stuff, I'm on X now, I guess, as jared.alderman, I think. I don't even know. Let me check. I'll make sure to tag you in there so people can the find The Jalderman. You. Sorry, that's what it is. The Jalderman with two N's. The and then I'm jared.alderman on Instagram. So All right. He's all over the socials, folks. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was super cool. Uh, if, if, if this is... You know, something, you know, I don't exactly know who, who watches these, but like, um, yeah. if you're at all like looking to take kind of things to a deeper level, I do suggest finding somebody like Jared, like Jason, like Jared, uh, Tendler, like, like whatever it may be, um, to try new things and to try to think a little bit deeper about, uh, yourself and how, how you, just approach whatever it is you're doing here and what what you're trying to accomplish and uh it's been it's been a cool think tank for me and i appreciate kind of you guys taking the time to uh spend with me and not i, I don't have to pay for it which is just great yeah. it's just free yeah it's free <laughs> all right but cool thanks and i uh, hope to chat again soon and maybe we'll do some sort of um uh, maybe in a, in a while, do something with you and Jason and do like a three-way call or chat more about this in the, in the long run. That'd be awesome. I love Jason. He's a good friend. So cool. All right, Jared, take it easy. Thank, Thank you. you.